Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ben Churchhouse, and welcome to the HR Congress podcast today. I'm joined by a very special guest, Mr. Mark Mandongan. Mark is currently the head of HR for multiple business units within Arcella Mittal and is reporting to a group management committee member. And I wanted to start off with a question on the demographic angle to begin with. So as more and more young people enter the marketplace, the types of careers that they're going to be having are very different to those that their parents or grandparents would have been entertaining. So what role does HR have to play in creating an environment of opportunity and growth and potential possibilities for them? Thank you. That, that, that is a very good question. Uh, I will admit, of course, if I knew the answer to all the questions, uh, I'd probably be in a slightly different role than I am now. But my assumption of the situation, uh, if, you, if you look at the, the people who are currently at school, so let's uh, to speak our children, 65% of the jobs they will be lending in doesn't exist yet. Now, what does that mean? It does in principle mean that the schools they are at are not preparing them for the work they are going to get. That's not a mistake of the schools because, as stated, the jobs don't exist yet. Now, if you then look at what is, who is then, so to speak, accountable for that, for that problem, traditionally we could say yeah, that the government, they should augment the schooling system. But perhaps also they, there nothing can be done because the jobs don't exist yet. So it's very well possible that at the end the companies need to take over this element of skills deficiency simply because we would know earlier what skills we are going to need and where skills are progressing towards. And if that is true, then you can indeed imagine that HR, the learning and development function in organizations, has to take a much more almost educational position towards making sure that the future employees get indeed the skills and the capabilities needed for the jobs of the future. Because as said, at the moment we can have predictions in the area of artificial intelligence, broad artificial intelligence where less automation will take place or narrow artificial intelligence. But at the end, we really don't know what's going to happen. But we should be prepared that indeed the people need clearly to be trained for the new capabilities required for the companies because less than perhaps at the moment is already the case. In future, it will be even more difficult to find the people on the market who have the skills we are needed. And I think indeed companies are going to be in, so to speak, the duty to make sure that the people get that skill set needed to do the jobs. Yeah, it's going to be obviously a very huge challenge. And I know a lot of companies are looking into it at the moment. And this is a theme that I've heard from a number of HR professionals, uh, leading organizations, the need to constantly retrain, the need to constantly put in talent strategies that are there to help the business sort of look future forward, but at the same time, understand that the changes are happening now and they really need to be you know, taken care of. And obviously one of the changes that you touched upon there is AI and robotics. And we know that they're gonna have a profound impact on the workforce. So many jobs will become outdated or already have. As an HR leader, how do you balance out capturing the, the opportunities that these technologies provide, which of course it's undoubted, with providing employees with an understanding of the realities of the marketplace and how do you sort of channel those uncertainties into something that's more productive? This is a huge challenge we are, we are facing, uh, facing every day. Also within the company I work with, we have shared service centers where certain transactional tasks are being mo moved to before being robotized and hence impacting a number of transactional jobs which are currently being done, for instance, in factories we're having or in the countries we are working for. And I think as an HR leader, uh, people involved in uh, managing this company, the company has, I think, they had a huge social responsibility. If you're looking into, into our company as well, you see on the one hand, we are a very cost-driven company because steel industry is very cost-driven. But you see as well that the social accountability is taken very seriously. Yes, we move these jobs to the shared service center. They'll be robotized there. But in principle, we aim for the fact that nobody will be out of a job because of that. So indeed, this means we need to retrain the people. We need to give them alternative occupations in the organization. In the long run, indeed, it could be that if they then finally retire, they will not be succeeded anymore. But that means that the current people who are impacted by the robotization will not uh, be out of a job because that, I think, is an obligation a company has. Uh, people are not disposable items. If you don't need them anymore, you, you just move them out. No, we have an obligation to them and we have an obligation to society. And if you specifically, of course, in case of larger organizations like ArcelorMittal, we are about 200,000 people. 
you cannot just ignore that obligation. And I'm very happy to work in a company that doesn't do that. But indeed, it's a lot of extra work to do, specifically in the area of HR, retrain them, make them qualified so that you can make use of their capabilities and the experiences they already have in your company to do different work. But yes, they will be informed and informed in time. We will take care of you, but you're going to do different work in the future. And I personally always think that honesty and clarity may sound hard, but in the long run, it is not. You allow them to be prepared for the future and you help them prepare for the future. So that at the end, they know, hey, this company takes care of me. It might get hairy, but in the long run, they'll secure me a job. And as long as you get that relationship with your people, they will be prepared to deal with these changes. Very interesting point that you raised. And I've heard this coming from a, a number of other speakers, including Jared Penning who, from Shell, who I just interviewed a couple of days mm -hmm. ago. And one of the things that I wanted to really touch on specifically demographically is we know that the healthcare levels are rising throughout the world, particularly in developed nations and life expectancies are rising. And with this, we can expect the retirement age to probably increase throughout many countries. So with this rise, generally speaking, and aging workers, obviously then sort of continuing on in the workforce, being retrained, finding yeah. different career paths, what kind of strategies do you see emerging to deal with quite a large and perhaps, um, say under the radar demographic shift because we talk a lot about millennials we talk a lot about the younger workers digital natives etc but what about the people who are in their 50s or 60s now who are going to be doing something potentially wildly different to what they were maybe 10 years ago or 15 years ago as they get older yeah well, you're absolutely right that it, this is this is a very uh, a very touchy point indeed i think uh, linda uh, linda Gretton and has put it very nicely in her book, The 100 Year Life, eh, that the children currently born have a 50% chance to live to be 100. And if you then indeed look towards the pension schemes, which, for instance, allow you to retire at 70, but if you then calculate it through, you'll see that there is about 8 to 10 years pension ready for you, which means then that the, com that the state can pay for you until you're 80, but you live to be 100. So there will indeed be a massive shift. And I think on the one hand, yes, on the pension items, and I'll elaborate on that in my, in my speech as well. But also you'll see that companies, and also companies like ours, if we're talking into a steel factory, there is a lot of work which still is to a certain extent physical or hard to the body. Uh, you, if you're just talking about the, the 24 hours continuous shift systems. So what do we do then with people who physically cannot do that anymore? And we're doing a trial actually in our factory in Bremen in Northern Germany, where we are together with the local chamber of commerce, looking indeed at what kind of skills can we retrain these people to, including what kind of training works best for more senior employees. Because the interesting part is, if you're looking at the way learning and development is often set up in organizations, and the way we want to transfer knowledge, that is based on the fact that the people we transfer the knowledge to are, say, mid-30s to mid-40s. But the methodology is not based on the fact that perhaps they're going to be mid-70s. And we are lucky we have in, in Bremen a lady who did her PhD specifically on this topic. So she's running a number of pilots there. And it's indeed very interesting to see how flexible a very senior people still are if you have indeed the delivery method augmented to the way they are indeed best able to, to capture this. And indeed what you see there, we are now working to have our more senior people much more taking an active step back but getting involved, for instance, in mentoring young people, uh, mentoring people deal with, deal with the work in the factory and helping these people to become successful as well. And you see that a number of our more senior employees are extremely grateful that they can share the, the experience they're having and not the knowledge of the modern technologies because the fresh joiners have that much better than they, but they can speak from experience and give that experience onward to the young population. And they're very grateful for that because it's a, it's a new way of doing that. And let's be honest, if we are now having certain machine-based trainings in our site, why would I use an external consultant to do that if I have a person who's, who's spent 10 years on that machine? And why isn't it much more useful to have our more senior employees transfer that knowledge? Yes, we need to train them for that, appropriate to what fits to their, to their age. But in that way, we have, we have a huge potential again in-house for internal trainers, for mentors, people shifting to a different role, but again, thereby seeing, hey, the, country, the company is, is actively thinking about this challenge, and therefore, uh, they're also interested, because what you've seen, I've had that in another company as well, 
where we did it the other way around. We started pulling retirees back into the company, just part-time, but indeed just so they keep, keep in touch with the workforce. And you see by a number of these people, they really like that. Not so much literally for the income, of course, that is nice, but also just to, to stay in the middle of life and not being, for some of them who work 40 years in continuous shift system, they feel they're, they're, they're put on the sideline of society. And in this way, you can use on the one hand their capabilities, their huge amount of experience, and from their side, and they keep being involved in the company they worked for 35 or 40 years. And I think that is indeed, those are initiatives which I'm very interested looking at both in our company as in other companies, because that is really a way we need to go to. And that's one of the important points that I love, love to bring up in these conversations is ensuring that people are given a purpose whether it's a purpose yes. at work now as someone who's 25 years old or someone who's 75 years old, that purpose and that meaning is going to be so important because in, in this day and age, it seems like if we watch too much media, if we watch too much social media, that the purpose is bleeding away from things. Everything seems so, so fake and so temporary, basically. But yes. there are still so, much, so many things that can be done to create meaning and value. And uh, obviously looking after to elderly or aging workers is going to be incredibly important. Well, thank you, Mark, for joining me today. If there's any way anyone wants to get in contact with you with any questions, just in the meantime, is there a way they can uh, reach out? They can reach me on my private email, which is dr.mark.van.dongen at gmail.com. And uh, of course, I hope to, I hope to be able to answer uh, all questions that come in on that way.